copy of God's Word and join me in the Old Testament book of Joshua, in chapter 1. We'll look at verses 1 through 9. If you missed a Sunday a couple weeks ago, then uh, you missed a lot. Um, I announced that a, a church had reached out, a pastor search team uh, sought me, was not on my radar. Uh, my radar was Robin Wood, and the Lord, uh, through various circumstances, brought that group uh, and crossed our paths, and I went and preached in view of a call uh, last Sunday, and uh, God confirmed that call. I mean, it was a unanimous uh, decision on their end. Uh, that's pretty rare, so I don't know if you know that or not, but that is rare, so what that did was that, that confirmed. That, that's, that's God moving And confirming a lot, confirming God's will for them, uh, confirming God's will for me and my family, but it also confirms God's will for you, that you can have absolute confidence that although this is not desirable and although this is not ideal, that this transition is right in the very center of God's will. And when you can know that you're in the center of God's will, look, there's some comfort there because that means you can trust him. And typically, no one really signs up for, for transition. If you look at transitions, no one's really trying to uh, go off and do something new. I mean, that, that's kind of rare. I mean, people like to uh, do what they have been doing and kind of get comfortable and mo- go in that rhythm. And once you've established a good rhythm, uh, no one really wants to mess that up. And so no one typically signs up for a transition. Uh, When you look at transitions in the Bible, we're going to look at a significant one. Uh, Many transitions occur, but this one's a more famous one with Moses and Joshua. And you look at their transition of leadership. Moses wasn't signing up for this. Moses wants to go in the promised land. In fact, he's still trying to barter with God about, hey, look, you know, is there any kind of way that, you know, I I can go? And basically God says, "Uh, it's enough discussion. No, the answer is no. And on Joshua's end, he's not up for this really either. That's a lot of, I mean, he saw Moses' ministry. He's not really looking forward to this. And so both find themselves in a transition. And on everybody's part, Moses, Joshua, the people of God, they're kind of wondering, is Joshua capable of what Moses did? And everybody's like, hey, we had some good things going. What's going on now? And then everybody is put in this situation that, yes, it's God's will, and now it's time to trust him. And uh, we find ourselves in a similar situation. The title of the message this morning is Trusting God in the Transition. There's three things I'd like to just pull out for us in this passage, uh, verses 1 uh, through 9. And uh, we'll, we'll look at each one. And one thing I'll emphasize is uh, they're all spoken before they actually happen, which gives us great comfort that God knows the future. Nothing catches God by surprise. The first one we'll look at is uh, God's provision is prepared in advance in this transition. Look with me in Joshua 1, verse 1. It says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. First thing I just want to pull out as we just walk through this text is that God's provision is already prepared. He is speaking something in advance. Before they cross over the Jordan, Joshua is getting a a word from God that says, wherever you go, wherever you go, wherever you walk, uh, every place you set your sole of your feet to, I have already given it to you. Now, for God to already give you something, you know what that means? He has to already be there. For God to prepare something in advance, that means God has to go out front and make the path straight and smooth it out and and then declare which way you need to go. 
And so what he's telling Joshua is, you're on this side of the Jordan, but there's not one place you will step foot on on the other side of Jordan that God has not already been. Now that's some comfort when you know God's provision is already prepared beforehand. And I would tell you this, transitions become a little less difficult. They're difficult nonetheless. No one wants to really sign up for it, but it becomes a little bit easier. It's in fact more comforting and encouraging when you know that regardless of the season, regardless of the transition, that when you walk forward and following God's leadership, you're not going anywhere where he's not already been. And that's exactly what he's telling Joshua. I have already given this to you. And so uh, he prepares the way. And that's God's job. And none of us really, uh, we have a tendency to get out in front, but you don't want that job. Trust me. And I don't want that job. It's God's job to be out front. What is our responsibility? We don't have to come up with a plan. We just need to know what God's plan is and follow it. And as we do, we are promised that God's provision is already prepared as we just get behind. And as we walk forward, we will find that he has already been to every place. And that's, in fact, what they do. If you continue reading in the book of Joshua, they encounter a woman named Rahab. And the first thing Rahab says is like, hey, we heard about y'all. Everybody's scared to death. You know why? Because God's already been ahead of them. God has already gone before the Jordan. God is already out front. Let me just remind you of a famous psalm, but I hope its familiarity doesn't take away from its power. Uh, Psalm 23. Let me read to you verses 1 through 3. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. And look at this part right here. He leads me. What does David say? He, God is the, he is the leader. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. David says, look, I'm a shepherd by profession, but I'm not the one out on front on this deal because the Lord is my shepherd and he is the one who leads me. And as he leads and as he prepares the provision and as you follow, guess what? You won't lack a thing. You won't lack nothing because his provision is prepared up front. Now, whose name's sake is it for? David says he's doing this for his name's sake. Now, just imagine for a moment if you see David taking uh, some sheep, a flock of sheep, and he's leading them through the wilderness. He's leading them through some green pastures, and he's going to lead them in the valley of the shadow of death. And as he walks down in this valley... And yet, he comes up and there's no sheep behind him and he lost all the sheep. Is that the sheep's fault or would that be David's fault if that were to happen? People would look at and go, man, you know, it's kind of hard to blame the sheep in that scenario. That, David must not know what he's doing. See, the reputation of the shepherd is on the line when the shepherd is the one leading the sheep. And if the sheep are following, it's not the sheep's fault if there's no provision prepared already. That's the shepherd's fault. And so what David says, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. God will do it because his reputation is on the line. God will lead his sheep so that everybody will know, not so that the leader, David, will be exalted, not so that Joshua will be exalted, so that everyone will say, God knows what he's doing. He does it for his reputation. Now, if God is leading in transition and God begins a moving and you decide, I don't like the way God is going and I don't like the way the shepherd is leading and then you depart and you're going to go to the right hand or to the left hand of his will, whose fault is it then? You can't blame the shepherd anymore, can you? No, you start looking at the sheep. It's the sheep's fault. But as long as the sheep follow the shepherd, the sheep will find that God's provision is already prepared in advance. And you can trust God because he will do this for his name's sake. His reputation's on the line. That you would be able to say, he is my shepherd in the good stuff, when the pasture's green, in the wilderness, and the valley. And aren't you glad that you can say, he is with me every step of the way, and he will do it for his name's sake, his provision is prepared right up front. And so he will lead you for his name's sake. There's a 
second point here. We have God's provision prepared in advance, but you also have God's presence promised in advance. Look in verse 5. God tells Joshua, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Now that's a good word. This is, remember, on this side of the Jordan. They have not crossed yet. God says, look, I'm going to go and I'm going to be before you. And uh, I'm going to be with you every step of the way. I've already prepared the provision for you. I've already given it to you. And I am with you. And he says, no man's going to be able to stand against you. What is God saying? He's not saying that there's not going to be opposition. You continue reading in Joshua. What do you see? Opposition on every front. What he's saying, though, is that there will be opposition But no opposition will stand against you and be successful. That's the promise. People rise up against uh, movements of God all the time. But they're not successful. Opposition occurs in a church. But ultimately, when people are following God, it will not be successful. And so, as God's promised Joshua, I've already prepared stuff for you. I've already given it to you. And as I was with Moses... Man, that should ring a bell right there. How was he with Moses? Man, he was with Moses and power. His presence was there. And he says, I will do the same with you. And so every time they go and counter opposition in the book of Joshua, they weren't really picking a fight with Joshua. They weren't really picking a fight with the children of Israel. Who were they ultimately going up against? God himself. And I'll tell you, God plus one man or God plus a million men, that's the majority. And anybody that's going to rise up against God, I mean, they have a fight on their hands that they're not going to win. And so I just encourage you, find out what God's will is, move forward in that, and you need to know up front, there will be opposition. There always is in a church. or any, There's always opposition to God's will, and you just need to know that, but know that it won't be successful because God will fight for you. He fights the battle for you. He goes before you. He already prepares it, and the presence is promise. There's not a force in this universe that can stand up against Almighty God. Do you believe that? There's not a force in this universe that can stand in success against Almighty God and conquer. And as you follow the Lord, you can say this with the Apostle Paul. Romans 8, 37, you need to remember this verse. Yet in all these things, all what things? He was just talking about all this opposition, all the things that can happen in this life, all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. In Jesus Christ, and as you're following him as the good shepherd Lord, and you're following in submission to his will, you can say that in all the opposition and all that's going on, all the transition, I am more than a conqueror through him who loved us. You can say with the Apostle Paul, Philippians 4.13, another verse I hope the familiarity doesn't take away from its power, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That was true for Joshua. That was true for Moses. These were just men. That was true for anybody in following the Lord in transition. And regardless of uncertain situations, the Apostle Paul said, whatever is in the center of God's will, I can do it through Christ. Not my own strength, but through Christ who strengthens me. And you can be confident you won't go alone. He's telling Joshua, Moses is dead. He's not here anymore but I'm with you. What else would you need? What else would you need? Yes, the leader's not here, but God says, I am with you. And uh, Joshua would find it was God that was doing the stuff all along. It was never really about Moses. I think about the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, you can go to all kinds of transitions in the Bible, but the disciples, the 12, they found themselves in one. Uh, one goes away, so now it's down to 11 and they're on the last night in the Lord's Supper, and they have, they're there with the Lord, and they're in the upper room. And what does Jesus say? I'm going away. He tells them. And what do you think the disciples felt? You don't have to wonder. It tells us in Scripture, right? Because Jesus has to say stuff like this, let not your hearts be troubled. Why do you have to say that? Because the hearts are troubled. He says, I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going I'm to be with you. 
And then he says something even more bizarre in their minds. He says, it's to your advantage I go away. And if you're there, you're like, no, absolutely not. Jesus, we, we disagree. How is it to our advantage that you are no longer here with us? But what they could not understand is that as Jesus would go to the cross and suffer the wrath of God on their behalf, our behalf, and behalf of the world, that he would be buried, and then on the third day he would rise again, and then after some days he would ascend back to the Father, at the right hand of the Father, and then what? He would send the Holy Spirit. And he says, it's to your advantage I go away, because my presence here is preventing something, the next chapter from happening, and if he says to your advantage, he's saying, this is something better. It needs to happen. The Great Commission needs to happen. The Holy Spirit, through your witness in the world, to the ends of the earth, need to hear about me. And so then I must go away. But I'm not going to leave you as orphans. There's a change that's going to occur. You're going to still cling to me. It's just going to be different. You're going to cling to me in spirit, in truth. You're going to cling to me in a way that you hadn't clung to me in a way before because I'm going to send my Holy Spirit and he is going to indwell you. And then he will be with you for how long, does it say? Forever. He will be with you forever. And so they couldn't understand that. They're, they're what in the world are you talking about? But if, this is, if we know, and I think we can, that this is the center of God's will, that there is another chapter, then me being here is simply just preventing the next thing God wants to do. And God wants to do something else uh, that, that is apparent. And what you can know in this transition is wherever the sole of your foot treads, you will find God's already been there. You're not going to find something that, oh, he hadn't already touched yet. No, he's already been there. And you can have this promise that he will be with you. Just wake your neighbor up real quick and say, God's with us. Tell him, God is with us. You know why you can say that with confidence? Because it's a promise. That's a promise. You can say that with confidence. God is with us. There's a third thing here, and there's God's prescription for prosperity. Uh, we want to follow him, but we definitely want this part here. Look in verses 6 through 8. He tells Joshua, be strong and of good courage. For this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Can I just stop and remind you again, this is God's prescription for prosperity in advance. God is telling Joshua, I've already been there in advance. God is telling, I'm with you in advance. And now he's telling him, here's how you make successful. He's telling them, you're gonna, they haven't even fought a battle yet, and he's already telling them how to divide up the spoil. God is with them, and he's already ahead of them. And he's speaking as if this has already occurred. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you will, you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. And so he's telling him, here's the prescription. Here's the prescription of how you follow me and how you will find all the success that you need. So there's a couple things I want to point out here. The first one is this. You're going to have to address the fear by moving forward in faith. Well, how do we know Joshua was afraid? How do we know? Well, when you have to tell someone over and over again, don't be afraid, be of good courage, God's speaking into a heart that is a little bit troubled. He knows your hearts today. He knows all the thoughts, all the things you've thought about, all the things you thought laying on your bed, all the phone conversations that maybe you've had on the phone with someone. He knows everything, and he's speaking into this situation. Trust me, be strong. And of good courage. Trust me. And you address the fear by moving forward. Joshua, did you know this is like several times that he's heard this by now? Let me remind you of Deuteronomy 31, verses 7 and 8. Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel. So notice this. This is public admonition. 
He said, be strong and of good courage. Does that not sound what, like God said to Joshua? This isn't the first time Joshua's heard this. Mount Moses is telling in front of all people, be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. Well, see, it's been repeated again. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. God's not leaving Joshua alone about this. He's reminding him over and over and over again. He's already before you, and he is with you. In fact, if you go in verse 23 of Deuteronomy 31, he says, Then he inaugurated Joshua the son of Nun and said, Be strong and of good courage, for you shall bring the children of Israel into the land of which I swore to them, and I will be with you. So we have God speaking to Joshua in the sight of all Israel through Moses. Now Moses is dead and he's gone and now Joshua gets it again. You know why? Because he needs to hear it again. We need to hear this again and again. God has gone before us. God is with us. And he's given us this great prescription of how we can follow him. And so there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of, that's big shoes to fill. I mean, surely we can all understand Joshua's predicament, right? Would you kind of feel that way? I, I certainly would. After God did all that through Moses, I'd be like, Lord, you, you just, you got the wrong guy. Uh, there's, no, there's no way. I don't, even, I don't even know how to part the Red Sea. I've, I've, never, I've never done that. Never seen, I, don't, I don't see how that's going to happen with someone through me. All the plagues in Egypt, all the stuff in the wilderness. I mean, Joshua had a front row seat to it. But you know why he had a front row seat to it? He was being prepared and had no idea. He was being prepared for this moment, and he had no idea because he was right up front, and he was in training and just couldn't realize it. You know, I was thinking about this and thinking about when I preached in view of a call at Robin Wood, and it was an exciting day, and we, you know, went to lunch and everything after, and it was fine, and it was good, and I'll tell you this, that excitement wore off pretty quick, and it wasn't, didn't take long that evening I was laying in bed, and Brittany's like, what's wrong? I'm like, I can't breathe. I can't do this. In fact, I regret everything that's happened today. <laughs> I want to go back and undo this. I, this. I just, the weight was on me, and just feeling that weight and the pressure of, like, of, a, of the, a pastor role. I mean, I'd been here before Robin Wood. I was here in various roles, but when that moment happened, it was like, uh, I'm not up for this anymore. I'm, i I'd I don't, I can't do this, and just felt all that weight, I really did, I was like, I can't breathe, I'm going to have an anxiety attack laying in my bed, well, the next morning, y'all go off to Criswell, because you know, Monday, I had a class, and I'm up there, and I'm still carrying this around with me, although I'm smiling and greeting people, I'm like, on the inside, I still carried all that with me, and then uh, a professor walked by, and I was sitting there, and he was like, well, how did yesterday go, and I was like, it was fine. It went, went good. Everything was good, and I just, I really wasn't one trying to talk about it, um, but he's, he kept asking questions, and then he had, the one question that he asked, though, that I'll never forget, he says, well, do you think you can do this? And after that night before, and after all what I'd carried around, it took me about two seconds to answer, absolutely not. No, I, 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 in no way. And I started kind of, you know, venting a little, like, yeah, no, I, I can't do this, and I, I don't know what I'm feeling right now. I, and then he said, he, he let me speak, and then he countered and said, well, then you're the right guy. And what that did for me, I still thank God for sending him my way. God has a way of putting people in your path to say, be strong and courageous. And yes, there's fear. Yes, I can't do this, that, that feeling. But what you do in moving forward in faith, you're going to trust God anyway. And what those words did for me, it did remind me, no, I can't do this, but I can trust in the one who can. And I don't, he never asks us to go forward in our own strength ever. He never does that in scripture. Ephesians 6, 10, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Be strong in the grace, is what Paul says to Timothy, and the grace that is in Jesus Christ. You're not having to white-knuckle yourself up and bear up for this. No, the way you be strong is you tap into the unlimited strength and power of Almighty God. That's how you be strong. 
Yes, there's fear. Yes, there, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to move forward in faith anyway. And then what you can know as you do is as you move forward, every place where your soul touches the ground, not a spot you, you will touch, you won't find God hasn't already been there. And you will find he's with you. And opposition has come. I've seen it. But I've also seen it's never been successful. People have risen up at various times in ministry, but it's never stood. You know why? Because you can't pick a fight with God and win. All you have to do is, what does God want? What is his will? And follow, and you have all of these promises. But his prescription for prosperity, he also reminds them to meditate on his word. He says, yes, go forward, be strong and a good courage, but he tells them, here's how you can tap into God's strength. You meditate on his word. Verse 8 says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, so you need to, it needs to be spoken. You shall meditate in it day and night. It needs to be in your mind. This involves hearing God's word. In fact, if you back up in verse 7, as my servant commanded you, which Moses, my servant, commanded you, do not turn from it from the right hand or to the left. So Joshua, he heard God's word. He was in it himself, and that meant he must be speaking it. That's where you're getting into meditating on God's word. Now, the world's idea of meditation is empty your mind, right? Go find a quiet place and just empty everything, take deep breaths, and... Just find your heartbeat and, you know, and all this woo-saw. Look, that is not biblical meditation. Meditation in Scripture is not empty your mind, but fill your mind. Fill your mind. Fill your mind with Scripture. Because what happens then is that you're hearing God's Word, and then you're in God's Word. Guess what happens? You start talking about it. If all you're doing is meditating on God's Word, it affects how you think. It affects what you say, and it affects the most important thing, your feet. It affects what you do. You start talking about it. You start being about it, walking about it, thinking about it. It, it consumes you, and it prepares you, and it's the greatest prescription for God's prosperity in the Bible is to know his will and follow him, and you will be successful. And so be faithful to do this, he says, when, meditate in it, verse 8, when, day and night. Day and night. That's not a hard thing to do if you love him. When you fall in love with Jesus Christ, it's not hard to sit with the resurrected Lord as you open up his word. That's not hard to do when you know him. To meditate in his word day and night. And so I would just encourage you to be faithful to do that with your family. Because day and night, you're with your family. You're not always with them during the day, but at night time, I'm assuming you are. Get in the word of God with your family. Be praying for next steps for, for the church. Hey, let's, let's, let's get in the word together. That'll help all the gossip situations and all that other stuff. Get in the word of God. Let God speak. Let God's voice have the final authority of whatever you're going to talk about or say or do. Day and night. You know, transition time is uh, a unique and time for, for everybody. And neglecting God's word, there's never a good part, n never a good time to do that. It's never a good time to let dust collect on the Bible. There's never a good time to walk away from the Bible, walk away from prayer. But I'll tell you this, you especially don't want to do that during transition. You especially don't want to do that when you have an enemy roaming around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And who does he look for? Those in a vulnerable situation. Now is not the time to be skipping out on church. Now is not the time to be skipping out on service when the body gathers. You need to hear God's word. And not just up here. You need to have it at your home and with your family. And what you will find is when, if everybody in this room were to do that, you will find you're in a situation where, hey, we must trust God together. And you know what it will do? It will bring the group together. When you're put in a situation where we're going to have to trust in the Lord. And you can trust him in a transition. You can trust him no matter what we face. Another familiar verse. I hope it doesn't lose its power for you. 
Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You already have the light to your path opened in front of you. You have the word of God. Get in the word of God, yes, day and night. That's not hard to do when they were, Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life and he is the centerpiece of everything you do in your relationship with him. Get in the word with your family, get in it with your church family, and let the word of God put a bright spotlight on the next step that you need to take. And whatever that next step is, I can guarantee you this, because my reputation is not on the line here. It's the good shepherd's reputation's on the line. That as you take that step in God's will, God has already been there. The sole of your foot won't touch any place that he has not already been. But don't be like what we have a tendency to do as sheep, to go, oh, let's bounce this way. Let's go to the left hand or the right hand. No, let's come together. Let's trust God and let's follow God. And if you have these promises in advance that God has gone before you, God will be with you. And you have this prescription right here before you of how to prosper every step of the way. Verse 9 is the conclusion. He tells Joshua, have I not commanded you? That's a rhetorical question, right? <laughs> yes, he has. Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you. Where? Wherever you go. Has God not spoken to you today? Has he? Yes, he has. You know he has. The word of God was open to you. It was preached to you directly from the word of God. You got a word from God. Has he not spoken? Absolutely. And the command is the same. You can trust him. Be strong and of good courage. He is with you. He's before you. And he's given the word to you as a light to your feet for every step of the way. You can trust God in the transition. Would you bow your heads and hearts? Let's go before him and Proclaim and confess our trust in him. Let the Lord just calm your fear. Know those promises. God is with you. He's not going to leave you nor forsake you. But please understand when David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Those things don't apply to you if you don't know him. And one of the Things that you need to know today, if you don't know the Lord, is he has already prepared a way before you by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. He has provided a way in advance for you to follow him. He has sent his son to die on the cross in your place because he loves you. He has sent his son on the cross to die in your place because he is holy. And there is a just payment required for our sin against God, and the wages of sin is death. But God has gone before you and provided the wage by giving his son up on the cross for you. And the good news is he is alive today. He has gone before you today. The Holy Spirit of God convicts us of our sin. He convicts you, even in a message like this, if you don't know him, that you can put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. You can trust him. And as you trust him and give your life to him and begin walking in steps of obedience, you will find he's already prepared the way for you. In fact, in Ephesians 2.10, it says that God has prepared good works for us to walk in beforehand, before you even knew him. But it begins in a moment like this by trusting him with your life. Would you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ today? If you've never made that decision and God's spirit is speaking to you, don't neglect it. Don't reject it. Receive the word of the Lord and trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation. Others of you in the room, maybe you've made that decision, but yet you find yourself in a transition in an uncertain time. Just like you trusted him on that day of your salvation, you can trust him again now. He knows what he is doing, and he will lead you for his name's sake. Lord, we come before you. We thank you for our time together in your word. We thank you for your word. 
that we can come together around your word and that you will just speak to us. We thank you that you provide everything that we need. And we thank you, Lord, you have not left us as orphans. Lord, that you have provided us the helper, the Holy Spirit, to indwell us as your people, to equip us, guide us, to help us move forward with courage, knowing that we can trust you, the one who knows the future. We love you, Lord, and we just pray that you would move in this time, move in our hearts, or you would continue to do a fresh work in our hearts to transform us and equip us for the next step that you have for us. And we thank you that wherever we go, you're already ahead. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand to your feet as we sing this final song. If today the Lord has spoken to you and you know that you've never made a decision to trust in Christ, I invite you to come. I'll be up here at the front. I invite you to come and uh, we can pray together. The altar is open if you want to come and pray and just uh, commit your trust in the Lord that way and just tell him that you're, you're going to be serious with him in this moment. At family, and day and night, you're going to be serious and trust him and follow him. As God speaks, won't you move, you follow in obedience. May God bless you as you do.